the road ahead. And uh, we'll have questions and answers throughout, um, but I will also have a closing question and answer period at the end. Um, we'll do land acknowledgements and then uh, we'll speak to housekeeping a little bit. So I'm gonna pass the mic uh, to Samlane Kid. Um, I my name is Sanwane Kid. I belong to the Hao Gittens Eagle Clan of Old Masset Haida Gwai. Excuse uh, me, my... it's difficult to hear you. I'm not sure if you can come closer oh. or raise your mic. Yep, I can raise my mic. That's no problem. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, yep, no problem. Um, so my name is San Lanegid. It means daughter of the dawn, and I belong to the Haugat and Siegel clan of Old Masset Haida Gwai. Um, very nice to be here with you all, and I'm excited to have a little bit of a conversation about environmental racism and the impacts on Indigenous communities. And I can speak from my own experience here on Haida Gwai. How -a. Thank you. Um, so. I am currently wanting to acknowledge that I'm on Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Dene, Mitzi, Oji Cree, um, and historically Assiniboine uh, Nation's territory, so Treaty One. And that my the water that sustains me uh, currently comes from Show Lake 40 First Nations. Um, I'm new to these lands, and so I wanted to share with you a little bit of what I've learned and invite you maybe to uh, to do the same. So um, Clearing the Plains is a book by James Dashuk. Uh, that was a really important read to give me context to what has happened in terms of the Indigenous nations that were here and then the settler uh, colonial process that led to uh, how things are today. Um, I want to point out uh, Dr. Merle Ballard. Uh, she's an Anishinaabe from Lake Martin First Nations. Uh, she's an Indigenous scholar and associate professor of chemistry at University of Manitoba. I've had the, the pleasure to hear her speak. Um, recently had an environmental racism webinar. Um, and she has done a lot of work, including a documentary, documentary called Flooding Hope that speaks to the impacts of uh, the 21, uh, 2011 flood uh, where there was emergency channels uh, that were created that flooded and uh, led to a forced evacuation and relocation of her community. And they're still reeling from the impacts of that. And that's still something that's ongoing. Um, so if you are in Manitoba, I would invite you to look into that. Um, uh, so, and the other thing, uh, living in Winnipeg that I've come to know about ind Indigenous struggle here is definitely police violence. So um, Aisha Hudson, April 8th last year, um, she passed away uh, due to, um, uh, uh, by a police officer. And there is an inquest that has just recently been called by the chief medical officer. So this is something that is ongoing. And again, I want to bring your attention to, especially if you're in Winnipeg, um, as, and especially as the Missing Murdered Indigenous Woman uh, Day of Action on I think May 5th is coming up. Um, so to this, um, we're going to just do intros and then uh, move towards housekeeping. So I'm going to pass the mic back to Samane uh, Git and to introduce yourself. Hello, the good morning, everybody. Um, I cut kind off. Um, so, Salane Gid is my traditional Haida name. It means daughter of the dawn. And my English name is Raven Ann. Um, part of my experience is being an adoptee. So, from a very young age, uh, I've been impacted by systemic racism within Can the Canadian system um, and in and out of the medical system as well. Um, and so that's part of my story. And I made my way back here to Haida Gwaii, the unceded territory of the Haida Nation, and reconnected to my, my bloodline, my family, my sisters, my brothers, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, and more, most importantly, the land and the water. And so that's my story. And um, I'm 41. I have twins that are almost four. And that's a big part of a lot of the work that I do is to create a safe world for them. They are black and indigenous. So it's very important, especially in this day and age that we create safe space for all people, especially those people of color. Um, I also want to identify in place that I am half white and I did grow up 
um, with a white family and access to resources. So I am sitting in a very high, uh, a place of privilege and I want to acknowledge that for myself as well as being someone that was raised off island um, with access to education and didn't grow up here on my reserve um, in Old Masset, um, but have been here for the last 21 years. So I've um, been definitely working closely with the community here and I'll share a little bit more about my experience with environmental racism here on Haida Gwaii as we continue our conversation. So hawa everyone again for being here and looking forward to discussing a bit more with you all. Oh, uh, um, so a little bit about me. Uh, so first off, I would just say that this is, I'm not coming in as an expert today, but as a peer um, who's been passionate about ecology, ecology growing up, eco then as I got to know more ecological and social justice and decolonization. Um, I may make mistakes, so please do let me know, uh, reach out to me if that is the case. Uh, first and foremost, I identify as a settler. I'm white presenting and biracial. I see myself as able-bodied, Says heteronormative, um, and I go by she, her pronouns. My roots are Quebecois and Peruvian, and I was raised initially in Inu territory, and then moved to Haudenosaunee territory, so southern Ontario and um, Montreal, before I uh, moved to Haida Gwaii for six years, and now find myself um, in Treaty 1. I am an RN, so 2013 grad from McGill University, and I mostly work rurally, though I'm currently just uh, uh, doing a bit of labor and delivery at HSC uh, Women's in Winnipeg. I want to invite you all to take a moment um, to just think about your own positionality in this world, um, whether historical to current and your relationships to privilege and power and how this may inform you as we begin. Um, and I think this is kind of the moment for housekeeping. I noticed um, as uh, Jack invited you um, to put your name and um, where you come from in the chat. And if you want, you could even add a little bit more about your positionality and or include your pronouns to your name. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, we will be recording. Um, we will in be inviting you to put questions uh, into the chat uh, and someone is gonna uh, be looking, keeping a track of those and keeping me posted. How I, um, and then that being said, um, if we realize we got a bit of material to cover, um, we may also be um, moving those questions to the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Um, so with that, um, and we're gonna move forward with some definitions. So environmental racism and environmental uh, justice were really terms that were coined in the 80s uh, in the States. Um, so the definitions I'm going to start with here, um, I'm just gonna minimize the screen here for a sec, um, comes from the American Public Health Association definitions from 2019. So environmental justice communities are composed of marginalized, racial, ethnic, low-income or poor, rural, immigrant or refugee, and indigenous populations that live in areas that are disproportionately burdened by environmental hazards, unhealthy land uses, psychosocial stressors, and historical traumas, all of which drive environmental health disparities. Environmental justice communities tend to be underserved and underrepresented in decision-making processes. Race is the strongest indicator of health risks for these communities. So environmental justice communities are, in other words, communities experiencing environmental racism. Um, environmental racism is racial discrimination. Uh, it's uh, Bullard and um, Waldron. Um, Waldron wrote a, a very important document uh, called Environmental Racism in Canada that was presented to UNESCO uh, in 2020 and uh, heavily influences uh, this PowerPoint today. So um, Bullard is explicit in how it is racial discrimination. So the disproportionate location and greater exposure of indigenous and racialized communities to contamination and pollution, the lack of political power these communities have for resisting the placement of an industrial, industrial polluters, the implementation of policies that sanction the harmful, in many cases, life-threatening presence of poisons in these communities, the disproportionate negative impacts of environmental policies. That means that there's different rates of cleanup uh, for contaminants in these communities. Um, the history of excluding indigenous and racialized communities from mainstream environmental group, decision-making boards, commissions, and re regulatory bodies. Um, so environmental justice uh, in comparison, uh, or as a remedy for that, are strateg strategies or remedies for addressing environmental racism and envisions what is achievable when the condition is tr uh, treated through a variety of targeted policies. 
Um, I would, I, Dr. Waldron also further separates this into three sections. So really saying that a sound environmental justice framework needs to be based on procedural justice, geographic justice, and social justice, which draws our attention here. Geography is a big issue in terms of rural versus urban, uh, even remote communities, and then um, so forth. Um, there's some limitations, again, that I appreciate Dr. Waldron speaking to. So uh, she says in Canada, there's a tendency to complete race and class, to focus just on pollutants rather than uh, larger effects of social environmental stressors on health. And then the lack of consideration of uh, TEK or traditional ecological knowledge in environmental decision making. There's also uh, more to be said about uh, limitations of these definitions. And I wanna pass the mic off to San Lini. Um, so coming from uh, your perspective, um, what's missing uh, uh, at this front? So I've noticed that when people introduce themselves, uh, they say what they do in their profession. And, and in the Indigenous way, I introduce uh, who I belong to. So there's a little bit of a difference there, um, you know, saying what clan I belong to and the family group that I belong to and how I'm connected to the land. And so even just right there, there's a bit of a, a difference of um, how we navigate in the world. Um, so based on that as a, as, a, as a level of responsibility to our communities and our families and our lineages and our legacy that we leave. Um, so just to give you a little bit of feedback about where I'm coming from as well, um, I worked on the All Island Wellness Plan for Haida Gwaii in determining how we move forward with health um, through FNHA, so the First Nations Health Authority here on Haida Gwaii. Um, I'm a wellness counselor and life coach, um, and my main passion is experience experiential land-based education with um, indigenous, um, predominantly indigenous ways of seeing and knowing and being on the land. And so that's a little bit about what I do uh, as for work. Um, so if people are wondering, you know, how I navigate that world, that's, that's part of what I do. So part of the indigenous perspective, um, I think that can be more elaborated on is the intergenerational effects of colonization on our communities in that it's not only just um, you know communities that have a pipeline going through their backyard uh, but it's also displacement from land so when you know for myself being displaced from my land and my community and how that has impacted my mental health and wellness and well-being uh, while navigating in the world and um, talking a little bit more about a holistic perspective when we talk about environmental justice and racism um, in connection to health. So that was a piece that I wanted to add to the conversation um, in regards to thinking about health, um, not only just in regards to, you know, um, the medical system, but mental health, as we've seen throughout the pandemic, has been uh, predominantly a growing issue with overdoses um, and people self-medicating. Um, so I could probably go off on a tangent there just because I'm so connected into, you know, my own family struggling right now through the pandemic with lack of work um, and things like that. Uh, so I just wanted to add that piece about, uh, you know, systemic racism, uh, intergenerational trauma, mental health, holistic wellness, and displacement, and how that is all interconnected. In the You're still muted, Madeline. Sorry, I didn't realize I was still muted. Um, and yeah, and picking up from there too, it's like that piece of like holding your traditions and then having um, to deal with all, all of these oppressions that you've uh, that, like that you've gone through. And so like connecting with that, um, there's a great article by McGregor Whitaker and uh, Sweet Run in 2020 that speaks to um, and adds to an indigenous perspective to environmental justice and uh, racism. And the and as uh, Samani had pointed out too, like this is framed within a Western thought kind of context, which has a tendency for reductionism, categories, particulars, 
and just a, a, a very different worldview, which is not indigenous. So when we speak about water justice, um, is, say as an, a concrete example, um, indigenous worldviews would see it quite differently. Um, so water justice what, and how it is framed in indigenous ontologies and research and as well as um, indigenous communities that I know of. So on Haida Gwaii, there's um, uh, rivers are per, uh, perceived as having spirit as being beings. And I know that is the case uh, for many other um, indigenous communities across the world. And so water um, is often seen as a living entity with rights and responsibilities of its own. And so when we try to bring in water justice from the lens of the currently the United Nations right to access to water, we can see just how small or how partial that is to really what would be true water justice if you're coming in from, not saying that all indigenous cultures are the same, but many indigenous cultures really have that more expansive uh, view of what would be true water justice. So we can see that right now as we're moving with the definitions of environmental racism, environmental justice, there's a lot to, to just be mindful of that, the, that these are kind of still in the works and are still very much coming in from a certain um, mind uh, frame and uh, worldview, um, which we should question. Um, and in that, I would just want to say that even this year in 2021, I think in the Inu territory, um, uh, I think it's the Magpai River um, that was just granted rights, I think nine different rights to uh, as a river uh, that's in Quebec. And I know that there's been other communities like in Ecuador and Bolivia um, in India and Bangladesh where rivers are increasingly being uh, acknowledged as being entities of their own with their own rights. Um, so there is a shift. Now exactly how that will translate to healthcare, um, uh, I'll try to break, connect it later, but just to say that this is really like, a, we need to see bigger. It's nice to have definitions to work with, but it's also important to know that they are um, a little bit limited um, as well. Limited or limiting. Um, the other thing that I want to connect this to is on the one side, um, and I, I think again that connects with what Samane just spoke to, is like the the breadth and the vision and the worldviews of indigenous cultures of Haida culture um, are so large and so different. But in in the context of colonialism and, and genocide uh, in Canada, uh, what has happened is that it's indigenous peoples in Canada that are known to have the poorest water quality in the country. So just kind of like just putting together side by side those two relationships to water. Um, I'm just noticing that uh, Fiona has sent an uh, article about that, the river um, uh, in Quebec and in a territory. Um, so I wanna open up for a quick survey. And so we are curious to know, have any of you ever experienced any boil water advisories, any water shortages or water restrictions? Um, so please write into the chat, yes, no, and if you have, how or what kind of impacts uh, did that have for you? Um, and then while we're, you're chiming in, okay, I'm just, I'm seeing a lot of no's. Um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, Raven, and if you're able to read uh, a little bit of what comes up, uh, uh, share with the group. Um, so, uh, sorry, Sanlane, um, if you're able to help share uh, with the group. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit technically challenged here. Um, so, uh. um, okay. So, what I'm what I'm what I'm seeing here is no. Only when you're in First Nations communities within Canada, um, yes, had shortages in boil water advisories in my area. Mm -hmm. um, I know in Prince Rupert they've had a lot of boil advisories um, in the last few years as well um, it's 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 a huge issue you know um, that's our lifeline that's our you know we can't survive without clean water um, so I think it's important to reflect you know um, there's some communities that haven't had clean, clean drinking water for over 16 years um, so they even bathing in the water is is harming their skin um, from the inside out um, people have rashes um, they're getting really, really sick, um, stomach cancer, throat cancer, those types of things. Um, 
so I wanted to relate that back to my own community. Um, again, I feel like on Haida Gwaii, we're so lucky and privileged to be on an island where we have a lot of more control of, you know, what comes in and out of our community, but we are still, you know, um, an occupied, unceded traditional territory where Canada and BC do have jurisdiction over Crown lands. Um, and so they have been giving permission to industry to come here, which has impacted our river and waterways, um, predominantly with forestry and deforestation. Um, but the, the, the main um, thing that I want to refer to is that we're going to talk about a little bit is uh, the actions that we did during the global pandemic when we have been under a state of emergency here on Haida Gwaii and have our island has been shut for over a year to outside traffic. So the only way that you can come to Haida Gwaii is if you're an essential worker, which means uh, a doctor or a nurse or you're doing, you know, cement work or um, things like that that are essential. Um, so we um, asserted ourselves and we gathered up uh, a group of women when the fishing lodges um, were coming here to Haida Gwaii. And, oh, am I jumping ahead a little bit? Oh, sorry. I, I think that's super, that's good, actually. We're just okay. going to make that. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'll just speak on that a bit. We, um, the matriarchs in our community uh, felt that the fishing lodges were disrespecting Haida Law and um, protocols and disregarding the, the call to action to not uh, allow anyone to come on island during the global pandemic and they felt like that didn't adhere to them that they were following all of the BC uh, protocols um, that they were following all of the guidelines and they decided to go ahead and fly their clientele um, from all over I don't think they were coming from the United States but they were coming from Alberta and all, and all over throughout Canada to Haida Gwaii to fish um, and it is sport fishing, so it's not food fishing. It's not an essential. It's not an essential um, part of life for people to fly here and fish. Uh, it's it's a luxury, um, and so we, uh, the matriarchs of the community, came together and created a plan for us to get out on the water. And so we got out there in little rowboats with no motors. We just got together whatever we could. Um, and asserted ourselves on the water and um, and did our best to get in the way of any of the sport fishing boats that were out on the water and created a bit of a ripple um, and uh, to assert ourselves out there. Um, we were asserting our inherent right to our fish fishing grounds, our traditional fishing grounds. Also, um, two of our reserves that overlap are, they were in the waters of the reserve lands and waters, um, but that didn't protect us. Um, the government is still on the side of, of our visitors. And I think that that's the case again for this year is that we have all of the sport fishing lodges that are rearing and gearing up to bring people from all over the world here to Haida Gwaii um, and to continue to disregard and disrespect Haida law and Haida jurisdiction over our own land and waters. Um, and this again is, is another, you know, kind of slap in the face to indigenous people and our, our way of life. Um, we are still repairing the damage that has been done and, and is continual. Um, our livelihood and our connection to land and water is being strength it's 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 getting stronger every every year and i think it was the most people and the most women and children i've ever seen on the water last year um it was so healing for all of us to be out there um but then we we did get called back in because there was an outbreak in Haida Gwaii. so um through that the lodges did eventually get shut down and we all got pulled back into town to be with our families. But um, when we were out there on that water, we were fishing and gathering. Um, it was all women with the support of the community and men in our community. And so these are the things that we're looking forward to in regards to um, reparations and asserting our, our rights and our, our connection 
and relationship to the land and the water. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions about any of that, but I think we we still have a lot of uh, stuff to cover. And so if there is any, any questions, I can just follow the chat there and then we can address them as they come along. How was so much? Um, I'm going to, uh, yeah, just kind of go back, see, let's see if there's any questions there. Um, and I think that for me, like, it's really important as we were having this conversation as someone, uh, Kid and I we were talking is just like, we needed to see, or like, as I was initially speaking to this kind of smaller picture of what is environmental racism and environmental justice is just like, but um, I remember you were saying like, just, but like, you have this needs to be, the like, colonialism has impacted all of it. And these definitions need to include like, and it's not just like about these boxes of what it is, but it's actually like colonialism is completely in, embedded or is all of that. Um, and so I think we need to see broader again. Um, I know that we, to create policies and to create, you know, protocol like, and, and legislation, sometimes we need to have this box like thinking because that's um, the way that our current culture is, but, we, but uh, our current Canadian culture um, encompasses other and has um, obligations and I need to repair relationships with the indigenous peoples it has committed uh, genocide to in the science. So we need to like really also uh, see the limits and see broader um, as well. I um, appreciate the comments by Mark that I'm just kind of seeing in the chat. So um, we spoke about impacts to um, that you've experienced and I noticed there's a few that have are, are living in situations with boil water advisories and restrictions. I want to speak to uh, just it's sorry it's a bit text heavy here but some impacts just to really bring it home for you that may not have experienced that water impacts for um, there's eight Saskatchewan First Nations communities uh, that uh, that I'm sharing the impacts of here. And they were actually um, had uh, reached out to University of Saskatchewan uh, researchers because they were not being heard by the federal government, by uh, peaceful protesting, by media. And they were still having these chronic issues and they really sought out the researchers to help them document the work and really help them push uh, and move out of the difficult situations that they have been facing. Um, so these communities experience boil water advisories, waterborne diseases, a lot of stress, whether individual family ongoing impacts relationships, uh, impacts the um, any GI side effects, mental illness, you can imagine for anxiety. There's economic impacts, so the cost of missing work, uh, the cost of buying water. There's also cultural and spiritual shifts, so it can impact water ceremonies, it can impact the capacity to do certain traditional teachings. There's aesthetics, um, which you all kind of can take for granted. Um, there's also difficulties with personal hygiene, um, chlorine impacts on clothes. So some communities that have had needed to have really high chlorine impacts and so we just destroy them or uh, change them. They would often be stereotyped um, as being incompetent when non-indigenous indigenous plant experts came in before they saw that they just had huge system issues. They would really uh, experience a lot of frustration with federal policies that were not allowing them to um, meet their needs and then compounded health effects. Um, especially when the uh, more remote communities don't have regular access to healthcare providers. So that connects to the experience of Black Tickle in Newfoundland, which is an Inuit mixed community, um, where um, people in that community have such severe water restrictions that they actually sometimes would have to reduce their water intake, which would worsen their diabetes. Um, it would, again, I would amplify um, chronically or severely compromised health, especially uh, when you connect that with poverty. Um, there was also food insecur insecurity so that pop is often cheaper than water. Men, so often they'd have to go and get water um, from watering, uh, from, um, I forget the correct, name, but, uh, correct word, but like watering holes. And so they'd have to carry the water. So they'd often carry in sled, sled. So some men were delaying their surgery and had chronic back and shoulder pain, um, but because of the responsibility to get, to get water for their home. Um, there's also a gender difference there. So more hardship for single woman led households versus men who were usually tasked with getting water. So again, just to bring it home, just how, how, just how much this can impact a person, a community, um, a family. And um, just passing through, just a reminder that at the same time, it is a right and um, it's legally binding uh, since 2010. 
in, uh, in Canada, it's under the um, Section 7 of our Charter of Rights and Freedom. It's not as explicit. And um, again, Canada's a water wealthy nation. So how is it that Indigenous communities here don't have basic access to clean water? It just seems mind boggling and also very racist um, given the, the, the history of colonization. Um, I'm going to just uh, speak to a few facts um, for some of you who may not be aware um, about water uh, issues in Canada. So in the last decade in the 2010s, uh, at, at any point in time, about 20 to 30% of reserve water systems were at high risk of producing unsafe drinking water. Uh, in August, 2012, an example, one in five reserves were under boil water advisories. 28% um, of First Nations reserves are without piped water, 13.5 trucked in. So Shoal Lake, 40 First Nations that I mentioned when I opened. So they're a First Nation that has been providing uh, water to the city of Winnipeg for over 100 years. And they were on a boil water advisory for 22 years. So the, because the water gets clean uh, coming into Winnipeg. And that's had a huge detriment to the community because um, when aqueducts were constructed, it led to uh, a flooding that was supposed to be like a partial flooding, but created an island. And so there was actually quite a few deaths uh, in winter and through the years because it, there was access issues because they were very, uh, they were uh, they were quite more limited um, due to the high water level. And it also, um, uh, the water flooded their burial grounds. And so again, speaking to which communities are benefiting and how, it, you know, and, and why was there such a long delay knowing that this water, that they're providing water for a whole city um, to leave them under boil water advisory for 22 years. Um, currently, last time I checked on the website of the government of Canada, which I think was in February, March, there was 59 long-term water advisories in 40 communities, um, First Nation communities in Canada. I just want to remind uh, you all that the federal government um, had promised to end all boil water advisories by March, 2021 but wasn't able to. And there was, you might be aware, there's a bit of controversy last year because they had put this work on hold when the pandemic started. Although I think it can really be argued that that would be all the more the reason to make sure this work goes ahead. Because again, for uh, sanitation and for health and just for yeah basic human needs, especially if, if you're sick, you want to know you have access to clean water. Um, more recently uh, in a 2021 Taie article, there's also been mentioned that the lack, there's been a lack of monitoring of what are, have been the health impacts of poor water quality. So huge gaps right now, and um, that really fit under environmental racism in Canada, a lot, to work, a lot of work to do. My quick question to you is, was this news to you? Perhaps most of you here are aware. I'm just kind of curious what the, uh, yeah, if you can just uh, say yes or no in the chat. Okay, so it looks like a lot of no's. It is, it's very terrible. Yeah, I just wanna say like it, it's, um, it's, it's quite heartbreaking. And at the same time, as a settler, I think we, we all have a responsibility knowing better, what are we gonna do about that? Um, the numbers really are staggering. Um, I'm gonna just, given that the answer was no, I'm gonna give a specific example that even the more, I have to admit, like very much lights a fire under me for action. So this is the story of Black Tickle and Domino. They're in uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, so you can kind of see on the map. Black uh, Tickle is the community that's above. Below, uh, where, where there's a postal code that's Pigeon Cove and saint Balbe. there's actually a ferry that goes to Blanc Sablon um, from saint Balbe, uh, just to connect um, that for the Quebecers out there. Um, so Black Tickle is a community of 126, Domino's 12 uh, people. They're descendants of Inuit women and British men, and they used to uh, use that black tickle as a uh, summer settlement, but they were forced there in the 50s or 60s. Um, like, uh, and um, on the other hand, Pigeon Cove is a community of 80 and St. Bob is 180 and they're non-Indigenous. So in black tickle, they have yearly issues securing funding for water. They do not have uh, good water sources. There's issues with contamination of a lot of their wells that they use and they're not um, uh, as formal, formal wells. Um, in May, 2014, what happened and why I'm contrasting this is that there is water issues in both communities. Uh, in Black Tickle happened, I think a little bit earlier 
they were just suddenly could not, I think there was an issue with their pot portable water drinking unit, so PWDU, and it cost about $30,000 to get a new one. The government was only willing to give an give $20,000 if the community could come up with 10,000, but this is a poor community that could not. And that's where things were stuck. And so the, the only way to get unstuck was through the lobbying efforts of the Nunatukavu Community Council. Um, and it was a special grant only for a year. So the portable water dispensing units cost about $30,000 a year um, to run. So that was only gonna save them uh, for a year. And the issue in that community is really a large scale water deprivation as I mentioned in the impacts above. In contrast, um, the, the, the community of Pigeon Cove and St. Bob have piped water and there was issues, I think the, water, the pipes froze or there were broken pipes in May, 2014. And within a few days, the government was willing to spend more than $100,000 to restore water and as per the quote from the government official in the quickest possible way. So that just speaks to a bit of a discrepancy here. This community's I mean, they might be a little bit further apart when you're closer, closer, but still these are two communities, small communities, and there's quite a different governmental response. Um, the researchers, uh, Han, Han Han Sarkar and Hudson, uh, this is an article from 2016, found that um, in the community of Blattical, um, so as per the World Health Organization, there's a safe drinking framework that is like a basic that all communities should have which is part of like, again, that health equity uh, access to clean water. That includes um, a safe drinking framework that has health-based targets, monitoring plans, independent surveillance, operational monitoring and system assessment. And Black Tickle was either lacking or had inadequate, um, was inadequate in all those aspects. And so they, um, I think it's not a federal because Black Tickle isn't, sorry, I'm just like, like I'm reading Mark's comment. I think it's because it's not at least, it's not a reserve because it was like a mixed sediment. So they're Inuit and British men and they're not like, uh, what's interesting is Nunatu Kavut, sorry, I'm responding to Mark's, Mark's comment. So the Nunatu Kavut community is um, outside of uh, Nunangat, which is the Inuit um, uh, kind of, uh, I forget, the, the Inuit kind of land, uh, or, I forget how to describe Nunangat, but it kind of encompasses the, the different um, uh, Inuit um, communities uh, across the north. So I think that's why they're not they're not a reserve, but they are not they're a racialized community as well. There. Um, and then the other thing that I want to point to is that most of the information that you've heard, most of those stats are um, coming from an informed First Nations persons of Canada, Canada but amidst Mitzi and amidst uh, Inuit perspectives. So um, the Inuit Tapere Kanatami um, uh, uh, report of 2020, uh, which groups Inuvialuit, Nunavut, Nunavik, and Nunatsiavut, um, researched what was the situation for water in their communities, given that there's a, a, a huge lack of, of this research by researchers themselves, as well as government. Um, and you can see here that um, in Nunavik, there is 3,997 total days under boil water advisories. The number is 3,784 in Nunat Siavit, which is uh, under uh, Labrador. Uh, the numbers are a bit smaller for Inuvialuit and Nunavut. Overall, the research did, uh, this study did find, or this report did find that there were problems with aging water infrastructure, increased demands on available housing and community water supply, and a significant infrastructure deficit and how these issues tend to be overlooked by the government as well as researchers. So especially in light of climate change that's coming and, and, and how that's going to impact their communities. Um, this is definitely like, again, uh, an issue that is uh, not reported enough and not uh, properly addressed. Um, I'm going to just um, move on now. I'm just going to do a quick time. Was there any questions in the, in the chat box? I'm just going to take a It looks like we're good. Um, so I'm gonna uh, just move forward here for the last kind of like 15 minutes because I wanna move towards a and a um, I also wanna let you know about a few stories. So environmental racism and justice in Canada, Amjanan um, or near Sarnia is a community that's really well known for the huge amount of uh, like um, impacts to their health, their wellness from all of the uh, petro industry that's right next door. 
also the tar sands. Um, you might not, might not know about the story of Africa, which is, was uh, right by Halifax in Nova Scotia. So this is a community that was created by African Nova Scotians in 1848 that was destroyed in the 19, uh, I think it was 1960s to 1970s. Um, I'm just going to, sorry, just jump ahead here to that, to that slide. Um, so Africa from the beginning experienced discrimination and poverty because they made re repeat requests uh, to the, Halif the city of Halifax to bring in sewage, access to clean water and garbage, which other uh, neighborhoods of Halifax did have. They did pay their taxes, but they were constantly refused. Eventually, uh, and the city started bringing more and more undesir undesirable developments to this area and eventually brought in um, the decision to relocate them using a human rights language saying that they wanted to increase their standards of living, but they were actually um, destroying their community in the process and the consultation process, uh, the people involved with the consultation only consulted with like 20% of the community. Um, there were, and so they were forced to evacuate this community or to move out um, if people didn't have deeds with a lot of uh, these people didn't have, um, especially from even if it was a multi-generational household, um, they would only be given $500 for their house. And this was in the, I think, 60s that it happened where they're forced to leave. And so this led a lot of people. So these were more lower income, but they did have their house and they made do and they were adamant to keep their community, but they were forced to leave. And in, 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 in leaving this situation, they were forced to relocate in other places in Halifax, lost community and often lost um, their capacity to be self-sufficient. And so uh, uh, quite a few after that became dependent on uh, social income to get by. And um, so one of the big concerns here is that it really took dignity away from members of this community. Um, at the end to part of the undesirable, undesirable developments that happened around this community was a fertilizer plant, a con factory, a prison, two infectious disease hospital, three systems of railway tracks and an open pit dump. So that community was just kind of targeted, seen as less valuable and then just disposed of. In the 80s, um, people from that community started to organize and then in 2010, there was finally an official policy, uh, an official um, apology by the city of Halifax for what they did. There's now a museum. Um, there's also been, I think, some compensation given, but it's it was many decades um, uh, in process. I want to invite you now to think of any other displaced communities within Canada that you may know of that have experienced uh, similar situations. This uh, was really brought to light. I found out about it through uh, looking into the, oh, I'm just uh, reading about, um, I think Jack just made a comment. I'm just gonna see if I can. Uh, oh, uh, to the Metsi community in Winnipeg, so maybe we can speak a little bit um, to that. Uh, in a minute. Another, uh, so this I learned about through the uh, Enrich project. Yes, exactly. So we're getting to it. So um, Marg, you're, you're ahead of the game. So in Nova Scotia, another community that has um, been uh, fighting uh, issues of environmental racism is the Sipagnagadic uh, Mi'kmaq community. Um, so they found out that there was a project for natural gas storage and under, underground salt caverns um, on their unceded land by the Shubenakiti River. And there was inadequate consultation and consent. And so the, the water protectors uh, started doing some really some grassroots opposition eventually and led to a court battle. And only in March, 2020 was it, was the province's go ahead overturned and they were ordered uh, to resume consultation um, in March, 2020. So this is again, ongoing. This is another community that has been supported through the work of Dr. Uh, Dr. Waldron and the Enrich Project. Um, so um, you may all know about her. Um, she's made a lot of headlines these days. So she's a um, PhD associate professor in the Faculty of Nursing in Dalhousie uh, University, a sociologist, director of the Enrich Project, um, involved in many other um, uh, uh, works such as Rural Water Watch, uh, and the co-lead of the Health of People of African Descent Research Cluster at Healthy Populations Institute. Um, the project that she leads, the Enrich Project, is quite innovative, and I think it gives us um, ideas about solutions uh, in 
trying to address this in our um, in our work and moving forward. So it's a community-based participa participatory action research. Um, it uses par community-based participatory action research and publications, multidisciplinary partnerships, student training, community engagement, mobilizing, capacity building, government cons consultations, policy analysis and development, public education workshops, media and art, and all of that really to support Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities in bringing e environmental racism um, awareness and addressing it and advocating for change and how that's impacted their communities. Another thing I want to point to is really, again, how she um, separates it into two components, so distributive and spatial, and as well as procedural. Um, so just lately, uh, March 24th, I think, 2021, um, Dr. Waldron was part of two bills, one initially at the Nova Scotia level that didn't go through, and now at the federal level, as she was part of informing this bill, Bill C-230, which is a national strategy to redress environmental racism that has just gone through. So this bill will collect information and stats on the location of environmental hazards, on negative health outcomes of communities that are impacted. It will review administration enforcement and environmental laws. It will, um, it will propose to make, or it may make amendments to laws, policies, and programs. And we'll look to involve community groups, environmental policy making, and then really look into uh, access to clean air and water. Um, so as we're coming to this close of this presentation, I, I do want to try to open it up um, for y'all to speak. So I'm going to run through this a little bit. But in Canada, um, what's been really interesting to see is in comparison to in the States, in the States, the movement from the 80s, which really came, um, I think, from this, the South, from Black communities, where they realized that a Black community was four times more at risk of having a, a dump right beside their communities compared to a, a non-Black community. And um, that led, and it was just so, um, oh yeah, the presentation can be made available afterwards. Um, and so what uh, came out here, was just, it was just so blatant in the States that I think it led to really big upswell and um, it led actually eventually to the creation of an Office of Envi Environmental Justice. Um, so there's really at the federal level, its own office. And then what also created is even in 94, Bill Clinton asked that all federal departments and programs include environmental justice into their work. So, um, so that really gave a lot of strength uh, to it there. In Canada, uh, uh, at the, um, um, however, though, this isn't the case for the Public Health Agen Agency of Canada. It's hard to find this information. Um, when I look on that website, um, same with the environmental public health officers on their CIPHI website, it's also very difficult, difficult to find anything where they're connecting dots. Um, so the Center for Environmental Health and Equity in 2007, it used to have another name, they did a big workshop with Canadian Public Health Association, which is non-governmental, to really look into why it is that Canada, what's stopping public health from connecting the dots between environmental health and public health and human health and how those intersect. Um, and so they um, did a SWOT analysis of, and some of the weaknesses that they identified in having the public health uh, really address this is one was a lack of interest or awareness. So many environmental injustices are found outside of or at larger scales than the jurisdiction of public health practitioners. I can recognize as a nurse sometimes where there's something, you know, in my practice, you're used to your framework, your head to toe, your and so when you're talking about climate change impacts or even like sometimes bold, if you're not properly trained for these bigger, vaguer, more complex stuff, it's harder to, to incorporate into your, your practice. There's also a lack of public health buy-in. So the culture of public health, especially that of medical officers of health um, is, uh, and this was in 2007. So it tends to be more entrenched in a conservative and rationalistic paradigm that sees notions of justice as too politicized and against the grain of scientific objectivity. So that, so that kind of position really holding back public health from seeing the role that needs to be played. Also the lack of a champion and as compared to the states, there's a lack of jurisdictional uh, clarity between what belongs to the health and what belongs to the environmental ministries because it, it has to do with both. Um, there's also a lack of uh, concern about cumulative impacts the lack of public health presence in First Nations communities. So a lot of First Nations communities, you can think of Northern Ontario where there's a lot of merc mercury exposition, um, the, the side effects, the health impacts of mercury on um, human bodies, it's not as clear. It's, it's sometimes 
And so the, there was really a lack of um, public health or people that were skilled enough to notice what was going on on the front lines where it's happening, which means it was, it was just not being picked up. Um, there's also a lack of respect. So again, different cultural frameworks. So, um, so us coming from a settler Western thought, not noticing cultural consequences to environmental injustice. And then also with a more of a bigger lens, the lack of inclusion of biodiversity. Um, so the, there's very strong links between ecosystem health and human health. And this kind of connects with planetary health, but in our healthcare system, because we're so human focused, we're really missing some bigger pieces. And, and, we, and now I think it's more and more of knowledge. And I think most of the people here on this call know that to be healthy humans, we need to be in a healthy ecosystem. And, um, but that's just against the outside of our mainstream or our usual frameworks for health, for human health. Um, so I'm gonna back up just a little bit here in closing. So I do wanna note that I've noticed that the BCCDC and in the language used um, in Canada, there's often a mention of more health equity and then environmental public health. So the BCCDC does have some resources um, the CPHA and the Center for uh, Environmental Health and Equity are doing some good work. They're more research and then community action directed rather than in our institutions, in our like healthcare system. Um, there's an Enrich Project, a new coalition to end environmental racism uh, by Dr. Waldron. Environmental law has also tackled this. Um, so CELA, so Canadian Environmental Law Association, Raven Trust, which is uh, re respect Aboriginal values and environmental needs, Trust that there's also a lot of uh, legal work, West Coast uh, environmental law and other groups, but there's really a role to be um, created and a lot of work to do to bring this really into healthcare. Um, so currently right now, um, CAPE, I think recently and supporting Dr. Waldron's work, um, wrote a letter about the UNESCO report in September, 2020. That's a nice recap that I can invite you to do. CAPE is now offering, so the Kane Association of Physicians for the Environment um, and Environmental Racism webinar series. Um, the first one has started this spring. Um, ONEG and Kane, we recognize the Just Recovery Movement, um, which is a movement that says after the pandemic, we're entering into another world. We need a world where there's more equity, um, where we do listen and um, to Indigenous concerns and really bring Indigenous sovereignty to the forefront and integrate that in the Canada that we need to see moving forward. Um, the American Nurses and Health Association have also connected links between environmental justice communities and vulnerability to the pandemic. Um, and I just want to close to open up the floor a little bit, but I really want to bring forth as nurses, we do, there's a role for us in environmental advocacy, and it's very clear in the nurse and environmental health position statement, which speaks, and, uh, and also in our code of ethics, which connects advocacy for social justice and advocacy for the environment because there's a, a an, it's very clear that those are very connected. I do also appreciate how CNA has been able to write um, a bit of bolder statements acknowledging the concerns with anti-Black racism and also speaking to Joyce Eshaquan and the need for decolonizing uh, within nursing. So I think we're slowly moving in the direction where we need to go. There's a lot of work um, to be done yet. In the road ahead, uh, again, quoting Dr. Waldron's excellent work, she really recognizes the importance of developing environmental legislation. So there's Bill C-230 that I spoke about that has gone through. I'm looking forward to seeing how that uh, will translate for us into healthcare. There's, we wanna draw, and CAPE is really doing a lot of work to draw attention to Bill C-28 to modernize the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which will include a right to a healthy environment um, as currently proposed, which will bring in issues about cumulative cumulative impacts, which currently aren't covered. Um, Crown land and Indian reserves are currently outside of SEPA too, which has led to some other issues. And Dr. Horn in the CAPE webinar that you can access um, quite easily on YouTube really speaks to how that um, has been uh, impacting Indigenous communities negatively. Um, other things moving forward is government health promotion policies. That's maybe an area as nurses that we can work towards depending on uh, where we work. Uh, need for Indigenous-led environmental assessments uh, rather than government or settler-led, meaningful consultation with communities, anti-racism training and awareness raising on environmental racism and environmental justice, coalitions for environmental justice organizing. And I think as nurses, again, it's important to, to, call, to call to our organizations 
our professional associations to make those connections and to move this forward. Um, so for knowledge mobilizing, there's a lot of information I just kind of pointed to there. Um, and then for getting involved, I really want to invite you all. And I hope this has stirred a little fire in you, but I really want to invite you all to find what is your right action, depending on your work, your community. I want you uh, to invite you all to get to look at what's happening locally, uh, maybe the indigenous communities, whose land you're on, what are they fighting, um, you know, and, and, and where can you uh, come in to support that? Um, I think with that, um, I'm just going to, I think we're just quite about right uh, on time, but I just want to see. I just noticed we're a few minutes over time. <laughs> so um, any questions in closing, any kind of closing remarks here? Oh, yeah, you're welcome. I, we're, I'm sorry, I ended up having a bit of a heavy slide, a heavy presentation there, but thank you all for, um, for attending. And um, Maybe San uh, No, I think we're losing all our speakers, but I don't know if you wanted to close with a, a word or two. Um, how are everyone? It's a lot of information to, you know, jam into the one hour of conversation. I think we, you know, if we could, we could probably talk for days. I think everyone here um, in being a nurse care deeply about the health and wellness of, of all people here in Canada. And I think that that's, um, you know, where we need to come together as well is that we all have uh, good intentions um, and sometimes uh, the biggest work is uh, some of that work on ourselves. Um, you know, I'm going through it right now in therapy and counseling and um, and so, you know, unraveling our own biases um, and some of the own, our own um, tapes that we have running through our head based off of a colonial perspective or mindset um, that puts us um, in a different circle than people that don't have, you know, the indigenous indigenous people or people of color. So, I think that that's where we could work on bridging those those gaps um, within our own awareness and our own perspective and our own privilege, um, and see where we can start uh, doing the work at home. and see especially the people of the land that you're living on i really like that suggestion marilyn um is is identifying whose land you're on and seeing what work is already being done in community um and joining in where you can to support and i know there's that word ally and allyship and i think that there's a lot of work to be done too to understand that um being an ally is, is an action. It's it's not a, a self-proclaimed title. It's it's uh, is something that is is very uh, action-based, and uh, a lot of self-reflection and self-work is done in, in that kind of work. So, um, speaking from you know a wellness counselor perspective, um, I, I in doing in, in doing my own work, it's not easy, and you know teasing out teasing out that co that colonizer the eurocentric um, mindset and really looking at ourselves and how we can align um, and broaden our perspectives um, and so that's my that's my closing and so how are everyone for for showing up and learning and i think the journey is every day um, becoming more aware of what's going on and how we can look after ourselves so that we can again in turn look after and help out and align with others so how was so much and take care how, uh... thank you very much both of you it was very very jam-packed full of examples and concrete ways in which we can move forward which is great because i think sometimes when we do these kinds of webinars it's so focused on like theoretical or research-based, but we also need to know how to do concrete actions and how to move forward together in on the journey to um, as allies, which is exactly what we spoke about today, which is excellent. Um, I think for time, we're gonna close. However, I would like anyone who might have questions, I will type uh, my email in the chat and that way, if you have questions, I can forward them on to San Malay as well as Marilyn. And just a reminder that the um, 
webinar is recorded. So if ever anybody requests um, to be able to see the um, uh, webinar or whatnot, just give us a heads up. We usually put them on our website as well. But if ever um, you want to have access or have more information, you can uh, more than welcome to message me. All right, thank you again. Thank you so much. That was wonderful.